Hello. Hi. Thanks for joining us. My name is Matt Miller. I'm an advisor at Versant Capital Management. We're an independent wealth management firm here located in Phoenix, Arizona. And today I'm really excited. We're going to continue a conversation uh, we previously began with our CEO and founder, Tom Conley. Uh, we've previously discussed a little bit about cryptocurrencies and kind of spoke about it in its generalities. Uh, today, we're going to get into a little bit more of, of how it manifests itself, and uh, it's a pretty complex topic to get in 20 minutes, so we're breaking it up here. So, Tom, maybe you can explain, talk a little bit about how does it manifest itself? You've heard of things like Bitcoin, and there's all these different products out there. Maybe you can share a little light on that for us. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So, I, I think uh, what I'd like to talk about today is a little bit about the ecosystem, crypto ecosystem. Um, and to help uh, just go over briefly some of the types of things you might read about in the media or talk about with friends uh, and explain just a little bit so you have some background to, uh, on under, to, to understand what some of these things are and how they function. But I, um, I'll try to keep it fairly high level. So uh, the talk was gonna be about crypto, both this and the previous talk, but in reality, uh, crypto is just a part of a big broader phenomenon called decentralized finance. So when you read uh, 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 printed media or on the computer or, or on watch TV, it, you may see something called DeFi, capital D, small e, capital F, small i, DeFi, which is a, stands for an abbreviation of decentralized finance. And the goal here is to try to uh, remove financial uh, transactions and even investments from centralized control of um, financial, the financial systems and clearing systems, traditional ones, brokerages, banks, into something out there in the, in the uh, uh, internet, the cloud, the ether, whatever you want to call it, uh, where it's not really controlled uh, by any central authority, regulatory agency, or govern, uh, government, and available to all. So that's what DeFi is, and there's a lot to it. Crypto is an aspect of DeFi, and is uh, intertwined with it. And so um, the, it all kind of started in 2008, when an uh, individual writing under the name of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto <laughs> um, wrote a white paper uh, and he detailed a software protocol that involved uh, uh, keeping records of transactions, not in a central ledger, but a, a ledger out in the public access. Any, uh, anybody can see it. Um, but transactions are verified uh, and uh, put into this ledger um, by what, what are called miners out there, which you've probably seen. And the miners... Uh, vet these transactions. They're approved by what are called nodes, and the transactions are written into this ledger. Again, available out there in the uh, to anybody to see, um, and they get paid um, fees and uh, crypto investments to do that. So the most familiar uh, crypto uh, investment is Bitcoin, which we talked a lot about in the previous video. Um, but there are many others. There are up to, you know, there are oh, oh, somewhere between six and 10,000 types of crypto. The last number I saw was 6,000, but that was months ago. By now, it's just exploding. So if, you, if you've ever heard about, uh, in science, the Cambrian explosion, where, you know, about 600 million years ago, um, uh, we have fossils of all kinds of bizarre forms of life that exploded at that time for various reasons and uh, our, the lineage to humans is in there, um, but most of those forms of life no longer exist, but there was this huge explosion of variation. And that's really what the crypto world looks like. You have, um, based on this software protocol that allows people to uh, participate uh, from anywhere in the world, any economic status without having to go through governments or or traditional clearing systems, a great degree of freedom and decentralization um, based on that idea and that platform is just an explosion of activity. And so uh, recently there's a lot more excitement because 
some of these uh, investments, these uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are up, you know, hundreds of percents just in 12 months, the last 12 months. And so they are generating uh, quite a bit of attention. So last time we talked about Bitcoin, uh, last video, which uh, is over a trillion dollars in value today um, and is by far the largest investment. And I'll, uh, I went over the, the coins, Bitcoin, the second biggest one is Ethereum, and they are um, uh, the two dominant uh, uh, coins, if you will, means of investment uh, out there uh, for crypto. Now, the thing about Ethereum, which is like Bitcoin, has its own kind of software, its own ledger. It's actually created technology around its methodology of, of um, creating and maintaining that uh, ledger associated with Ethereum. And they are actually expanding that technology into doing some other things that I'll talk about in a minute. So most of what you read about and what people are investing in um, outside the traditional financial system are Bitcoin and Ethereum. Tom, Tom, There's me... another phenomenon called stable coins. Um, and I think yesterday we talked a lot about the volatility of Bitcoin and Ethereum that they, you know, there are three episodes of uh, crashes uh, 80% or greater since 2012. That's a little bit too much volatility to function as a, as a means of, as a, as a currency or a means of exchange. So um, out of the uh, crypto and DeFi world came stable coins. And a stable coin is a coin, but it's backed by something. So it might be backed um, by a lot. Most of them are backed by the U.S. dollar. So they're supposed to be exchangeable. Um, you know, the, a unit of, the, of a stable coin might, is exchangeable into a dollar or even a basket of currencies. Or, or, or a coin, a Bitcoin. I mean, there, 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 there. But the, the idea is, there's a referent value behind the stable coin, which, uh, where you can count on uh, uh, receiving some value in terms of another unit of exchange, which greatly reduces um, volatility. And that um, universe is about fifty billion dollars. Uh, uh, as of a, f a few months ago, I don't know what the absolute the latest number. Tether is the largest. If you read about Tether, um, there are uh, Tether was involved with the New York AG's office um, with respect to how they were their accounting and how they were actually reserving uh, against their coins. Um, so hey, that's hey, uh, can yeah. I, can I ask you a question? So if if someone's buying Bitcoin, a where do you buy it? And then secondly, are you buying the company that that makes Bitcoin, or are you actually buying the currency itself? No, you're buying a Bitcoin, and uh, the ledger I was talking about. Uh, there would be a if you bought from another party, that would be indelibly transcribed on that ledger that that party sold, and you bought, and you're the owner of it, and nobody can go in and alter that transaction after it's uh, inscribed in that ledger. I, so it, it's you're not working with anything tangible. A Bitcoin is just a computer entry, right. you know, unlike gold where you have something you can hold or wear around your neck or whatever. Um, it's a computer entry and it's not centralized. You don't buy it from um, an exchange typically, although exchanges are forming now to do that. But um, uh, can, can these systems, Tom, can they just print as many Bitcoins as they want or is there a certain amount or how do they all work? No, part of the magic of Nakamoto's software protocol is that the um, Bitcoins are limited. Uh, there are only 21 million Bitcoins can ever be uh, minted in that system. Then it shuts down. No more can be created. And right now, I think there's 18 and a half million that are out there. Um, and it's estimated based, you know, based on what the current activity and what miners are being paid to um, uh, maintain the transactions in this ledger. Uh, they get paid fees and a little bit of Bitcoin that, that they'll last till 2140. So how about uh, you mentioned something called NFTs? Uh, what are they? And All right. Yeah. Are they used? Let's let me run down the list here of these things. So sure, there are sure. stable coins, um, which are address the idea that Bitcoin is too volatile to form as a currency. Um, and I mentioned they could be backed by a lot of things. And there's other things called 
tokens, you may read about tokens, where a token is analogous to a share of stock in a company that's involved in DeFi. Um, they're issued through initial coin op offerings, ICOs, as opposed to a stock IPO. And um, uh, in this universe, uh, the idea is to have these entities not be centralized. So the original owners of these companies typically lose control in these initial coin offerings. And so, of course, there are issues as to whether or not these are securities and stocks will be regulatory issues to uh, to go through, but they also, a token represents a, a, a share of ownership in a DeFi company. And then Matt, to your point, a lot of uh, what's been in the news a lot lately are non-fungible tokens, where um, uh, they're basically blockchain-based authenticity certificates that are attached to digital assets, like artwork or sports highlights or uh, autographs or things like that. Um, and they typically work under in the Ethereum system. So I mentioned the second most popular coin other than Bitcoin is Ethereum that had its own technology, underlying technology associated with it. It's Ledger. They've actually expanded that technology. And, and most of the NFTs or non-fungible tokens are issued in that, eco, that little sub-ecosystem. Um, and so... Uh, you, you, and, and lately, just very lately, um, people are taking works of digital art or digital uh, uh, sports memorabilia, um, and they're dividing them into pieces, you know, maybe uh, 100 or 20 partitions and selling those and where, to where the uh, dollar value of the parts are way more than the dollar value of the whole when they bought it. Um, hey, what's an example of that, Tom? Like, would someone sell a right to a song, and they're because of the way they can securitize it, they divide the song up? Uh, they're just graphic. They're graphics or memorabilia. Um, Interesting. Uh, yeah. So, the and and they're the key is they're digitized. They're not you. Know, you can't buy a painting that way. Sure. But but it, it, it's some and some people are just creating things and then selling them. Uh, in this marketplace, and they're getting some crazy values. So, uh, in my mind, this is frankly one of the signs of the uh, speculative environment we're in when things like this happen. Yeah. Well, um, so, go ahead. so the, go ahead, Matt. No, go ahead. Um, so, to, to, to sum up, uh, these are the different types of things you may run into, and then you know, Matt asked a question, how how can you buy them? And um, things are moving very quickly in this ecosystem. Um, most of the major banks and ex uh, brokerages are trying to establish crypto exchanges where their clients can access and transact or even hold some of these assets. Right now, you have to go out into the uh, uh, Internet or um, through private partnerships. Uh, to, to get access, um, but it's becoming more and more mainstream. Um, there are also some funds, exchange-traded funds or mutual funds that are forming up to get access to this universe. And I think I, I talked a little bit about this in the previous video, but they're, they typically um, can, you can, you can invest in uh, venture capital companies privately that are in the DeFi world. Uh, there are some funds that, um, uh, trade in uh, futures and options on Bitcoin or other crypto investments. Um, there are no approved mutual funds that directly trade digital assets yet, although uh, they have been applied for and a number have been declined, but it's only a matter of time in my opinion. And then there's an index fund out there that actually invests in stocks of companies that uh, that are involved in DeFi software or equipment or servicing of both of those. Uh, so those are the way, Matt, that you would, you would, you would access. That's a lot to, a lot to look at how um, <laughs> you and your team are, are constantly looking at all these things. Is this something I think we touched on a little bit last time and maybe I know the answer. Is this something clients can expect to see in their portfolios here anytime soon? 
No, the big point in the last video was that the, the digital assets do not do not pay any kind of interim uh, cash flows, such as dividends, interest, rent, um, royalties, uh, and the traditional definition of an investment is a is a, its value is a discounted um, uh, sequence of cash flows that you discount back to the present. And that's the value. That's the idea, central idea. Reality is a little more messy than that, but. <clears throat> crypto assets have no interim cash flows. They are totally dependent on what someone's willing to pay in the future. Uh, some people call that the greater fool theory that we buy now, we pay a price, and there'll always be someone in the future who will be willing to pay more. That is, a, in our view, a pure speculation, a speculation of the purest form. And frankly, uh, we are fiduciaries to our clients and and uh, a speculative investment like that has does not have a place in uh, in our client portfolios. Sure. Now, however, we are looking at some of the companies that um, work in this space and invest in this space and service it that actually um, get paid and have cash flows and are you know traditional investments. That is something that might happen in the future, might not that we're looking at. But as far as crypto. Uh, I wouldn't expect to see that in uh, Versant portfolios in the near future. Well, great, Tom. Uh, do you have anything else you want to add? Or no, I think we're good. I think we're good for today. Uh, the two talks, there's a little bit of overlap, but um, they are complementary, and uh, I hope we've at least taken the first step or two in helping all of you uh, wrestle with this as you get exposed to it in the media or read about it. Absolutely. And just to open that channel of communication between you and your advisor, if you have any questions about any of this, reach out to us and we'll, uh, we can't answer it. We'll put you in contact with Tom. Uh, but thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, it's been a great session, Tom. Thank you again for your, uh, your time and your insights. Uh, we look forward to the next one. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Tom.